Fascination with African art is nothing new to Europeans. The Duke of Burgundy bought an African idol from a Portuguese nobleman as long ago as 1480. Many of these masks and carvings have a sacred purpose. They were designed to be used in spiritual rituals and dances. They serve as objects of power or so-called fetishes, to communicate with the spirit world. During the making of this film, an African wood carving was sold by Sotheby's in Paris for a record price. It fetched over seven million dollars. Clearly, there's a strong desire for this work, especially the older pieces. But what does authentic in African art really mean? I'm going to start my journey in London. I've come to Hampstead to meet Andrew Chuniewski, who has an impressive collection of West African sculpture. I'd like to show you this, mm. because this piece is, um, to me, it's an absolutely wonderful piece of art. This is the Dogon couple. It's said to be Bombo Toro, which is a particular style. It's the most extraordinary feat to be able to carve a piece like this. Out of a single block? Out of a single block. And do you know what it represents? It's said to represent all sorts of things, including the ideal coupling, which is twins. The fact that it's been used is that an important thing? Yes, uh, it, it has sacrificial offerings on it, it has blood. There's something very powerful about work which has had an important function. It gives it an extra charge. How long, when you saw it, did, you, did it take you to decide that you personally wanted to own this? Oh, this was, I, I had to look beyond the, the, the state the piece was in, but Fortunately, I was able to see I, um, about one or two seconds, essentially. <laughs> it doesn't really take long. It's I was the, expecting you to say, oh, well, you know, I went away overnight and thought, you know, but, but in about, you know, in about to, one or two seconds, you thought You don't have to think. That I is. didn't have to think very hard about this, this piece, really. It's a wonderful piece of art. It is. But what made it? Do the Dogon people, their culture and their beliefs, the spirit that created pieces like this, still exist today. I'm traveling to the heart of West Africa to find out. My journey to Dogon country took me via Amsterdam to Bamako, the capital city of Mali, then north again on another flight to the river city of Mopti. The Niger, one of Africa's greatest rivers, has always been a life-giving artery, as well as a vital trade route in this landlocked part of Africa. In the 15th century, Islamic armies swept across this region. The Dogon felt under threat and fled to the cliffs of Bandiagara to preserve their way of life. Because a defeated people would essentially be sold into slavery. This river and one of the principal trades of this area was in slaves. Dogon villages built high up against the cliffs provided excellent fortresses against marauding slave traders and the advancing armies of Islam. I've come to the traditional meeting place, a low ceiling structure called a togana, to pay my respects to the village elders. Nous-mêmes, nos zones, nos jeunes, les jeunes de ce village travaillent pour les Togna. Kundu is a village of less than 40 families, and I gather that today virtually all the men here work as sculptors and carvers. 
I've got with me from London some pictures of the Dogon twins that I'm keen to hear the elders' views on. Everybody is intrigued by Andrew's statue, although they come to no fixed conclusion on its origins or significance. But one word I hear repeatedly is telem, and it sets me off on a new line of inquiry. Scrambling up the rocks to a cliffside village further along the escarpment, I'm following a path trodden by the Dogon for centuries, and also by a mysterious people who were here much earlier. Well, we've, uh, we've climbed up above the Dogon village of Yugaduguru, which we can hear down below us, to find the remains of the Telem. And in Dogon, Telem means as we found them. It's the people who were here on the cliffs before they arrived. These buildings here date from somewhere in the 12th century. They've been preserved because of the rock, and though they're only made of mud, the rains haven't got to them and they haven't been washed away. According to Dogon legend, the Telem were red-skinned pygmies, and nobody knows what happened to them. Perhaps because they were hunters and the Dogon were farmers, the pygmies disappeared and went down into the forest further south. But it's also believed that they may have simply intermarried and become one. But either way, there was an influence of the ancient culture on the new culture. And when people here look at Andrew's statue, they say, ah, tell them. It doesn't mean that it was made by the Telem. What they mean is that it was influenced by something very old. All around me, I can see evidence of people inhabiting this landscape from ancient times. The oldest cloth ever found in sub-Saharan Africa Funeral shrouds made of cotton in the 11th century were discovered in caves in the cliff. Apparently, a trade still goes on where people rope themselves up, dangle over the cliff and rob artefacts from unexplored places. The artefacts are then copied. Uh, the copy is shown to the customs and a certificate is issued and then the real thing is brazenly taken out of the country. Ever since the French anthropologist Marcel Gruyol came here in the 1930s, the Dogon people have been observed and recorded by more anthropologists and academics than probably any other society across Africa. And yet there are still mysteries and huge areas of dispute amongst the experts as to the significance and meaning of many aspects of Dogon culture. Anthropology is, as they say, a tale of two cultures, that of the recorder and the recorded. This dance apparently has its roots in the secretive nocturnal Awa funeral dance. The primary purpose of the dance was to lead the souls of the deceased to their final resting place. But Noam explained that what we were now seeing was in fact an adaptation, and that the dance was performed not at night away from watchful eyes, but in broad daylight, for outsiders and tourists. However, it's extraordinarily powerful. There's no doubt about that. What I'm seeing is something which has, for me, the great virtue of showing that you cannot really understand the art of this sculpture and these masks until you see this dance. The masks have a brilliant, sharp, abstract quality. A bold simplicity of design that communicates on a visceral level. Anthropologists have recorded about 78 distinctly different mask designs. And it's a number that's increasing as new masks are made for the roles of new characters. 
In the 1950s, for instance, during the French colonial period, the character of the commandant or government official appeared. But Western interest in these masks and dances has, in a way, stagnated them. Tourists don't want to see the new masks, only the so-called traditional ones. And so a sort of heritage culture is beginning to be kept alive. Noam's prediction that Dogon culture might be on the brink of extinction was a stark message that I may have arrived too late. Do the belief systems and the Dogon artists that created work such as this twin couple still exist? Monsieur. The man I've come to see in Tuba Dara is the local blacksmith. In Dogon culture, blacksmiths are revered and hugely respected because they're believed to have special powers. They can invoke rain, they're healers, and they have the almost magical ability of being able to conjure metal from the ground. <laughs> Dogon blacksmiths are, by tradition, also responsible for carving dege, sacred funeral statues made to appease the spirits of the dead. I asked Antuba how he goes about making a dege statue. What Antaba is explaining to me is it is necessary when making certain forms of statue to involve uh, Niyama, the great life force, in those statues. Partly because people are not as animist as they were, these statues simply aren't made anymore in the same numbers. But he made one recently for people in another village. And those people had heard of his capabilities, his, his creative impulses, the fact that he would do it correctly, making sacrifices here. And so they came to him to make it. We can't see that statue because it's an entirely private matter. But one of the key reasons I've come to Dogon country is to see if these special statues, the ancestor Dege, which are used as fetishes to communicate with the spirit world, are still in use. I now find out that, though now rare, they do still form part of Dogon tradition. The artefacts so prized by collectors such as Andrew are used during ritualistic sacrifices. And the man responsible for such ceremonies is the fetish priest. sacrifice that we've just seen is to ensure a good harvest next year. If it is successful, it will require another sacrifice of a goat or a sheep. In other words, the whole point of the sacrifice is whether it works or not. And the whole point of these statues is whether they work or not. They are not simply works of art or representations. They're objects with a spiritual purpose. 
And that's precisely what I've sat here and witnessed. <laughs>